This material has been reproduced and communicated to you by or on behalf of the Australian National University in accordance with Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. The material in this communication may be subject to copyright under the Act. Any further reproduction or communication of this material by you must be consistent with the provisions of the Act. Do not reproduce this material. Do not remove this notice. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Today is going to be a hello. Today is going to be a special challenge um, because uh, for some reason I'm not allowed to log in to this room. So I'm going to ask a good number of you to log into the Waddle site and go to the tile on the Waddle site that has the content weeks one through to six. And then for week one, select the lecture. So you just scroll, just go back there, just scroll. Yeah. Is it not visible? Yes, there we are. Just have a look. There's, there should be a tile that says weeks one to six. And I'm going to get you to put the lecture slides on your screen because I'm going to stand behind you and I'm going to look at them <laughs> because I might occasionally need to remind myself of what's on them. I will resolve this problem before next week. 
Before we start, I guess, uh, first of all, also sorry, we should have started five minutes ago. Um, I just had a quick chat with the other lecturer. Um, he said he didn't know that there was another lecturer on, so he thought he'd go over time. But we will ordinarily already be in this room uh, at 12 o'clock. Lectures, if you're not... Who's in their first lecture, anyone? No, okay. Well, yeah, great, all right, okay. So if you haven't been in one before, and someone hasn't said this before, lecture recordings, every lecture is recorded. ANU requires every lecture be recorded. The recordings kick off at five past the hour. And so I won't start until five past, and then I have to finish at five two. So that lecture that was just on, there was 10 minutes there that wasn't recorded in his lecture. So it should be recording right now. If it isn't, then I'll have to re-record it, okay? I don't think it re requires the system to be logged in. This is actually the way that lectures used to be run when I was an undergraduate student. Someone would actually talk and there weren't whiz-bang PowerPoints and so on. Um, it's not how I would ordinarily run a lecture, um, but we'll, we'll just go with it. I'm Matthew Brookhouse, so I'm the convener of the course. Um, and I'll be delivering every lecture, either in person or online. So no doubt you're aware that only one of the lectures each week is in person. So here. The other one is via Zoom. So I deliver it live, um, but it's over Zoom. Now the reason for that is because of venue shortage. Not, not a choice on my part. Um, but it's okay. It's worked okay, well, in the last, say, three years. And this is the first time since the start of 2020 that I've been in a lecture theatre with students anyway. So, you know, it's a sort of a gentle reintroduction for me. So the second lecture today, online, there is a Zoom, this sort of universal Zoom link thing on the, on the front page, and you just use that. And I'll be delivering it live from the recording studio over in Forestry. So you can still interrupt and ask questions all the same. It's, it's not some pre-record. Um, but of course, again, pre-recording -record, -record, all the lectures is mandatory. So if you have a chem track or something else like that, because I know a few of you do, if you've got some other activity on, some other conflict, then the content will be there for you online. Because I can't show you off, <laughs> I'll have to show you this afternoon in the, um, in the, rec in the online lecture so that we can, so I can show that and I'll have to resolve what the problem is here. This course is in its form for a couple of reasons. When I was an undergraduate student we had to do two units of statistics as part of our forestry degree. I did forestry as an undergraduate student and then moved to Victoria, worked as a forester, came back here in 2003. Now, we had to do two units of statistics and that changed sometime between when I finished my undergraduate degree in 97 um, and then when I came back for a PhD in 2003. And what became obvious during that period was that students were electing to take course or degree pathways that didn't include statistics and it meant that as graduates students were leaving without some critical quantitative skills. Now I know that you don't necessarily want to do a course in stats. <laughs> now I'm totally fine with that. Okay? I've been teaching this course now for like, 15 years and if I wasn't on board with that idea then I'd be an idiot, right? I was there too. In first year, this course, or its analogue, STAT 1003, was the one that you know, I, I really struggled with. And, and it's a, still shocking to me that I teach it now. So what happened over time was it became obvious that environmental science students who, who were making decisions to do a degree that didn't include quantitative skills, uh, you know, do a degree without quantitative skills, left without those skills. And so that was corrected insofar as this course became mandatory for all environmental science students. And then sometime later, because of the content, it became on par with STAT 1003. So we cover the same content, in effect, that STAT 1003 covers. And that's why, if you're a science student, that's why the two sort of sit alongside each other. But we do it in a very different way. 
I haven't sat that one double oh three for uh, quite a few years, but I know that we take things on in a very different way. Now, if you have a look at the lecture slides, now I should say the key difference between what we do in this course and STAT 1003 is the question of why. Why would you have to sit through lectures focused on you know, um, abstract concepts around sampling distributions and calculating all of these metrics if you have no research questions to apply those techniques to? Why are we learning this technique in particular? Why do I have to calculate it this way? Why, why, why? The issue that many students have with statistics is not that it is necessarily extraordinarily difficult, although I will say that it is challenging for many students. So if you find it challenging, that's okay, that's normal. The, quest, the issue that many students have with statistics is not that issue, it's the lack of applicability that, individual, that individuals see for what they're learning in a, in a conceptual space. Now, when you're a PhD student or an honours student or, you know, you're a researcher trying to work out why insects are killing trees in the mountains, you have those questions. They're, they're with you all the time. You're generating them as you're thinking about things, looking at things, reading. They're coming all the time. And it's a battle, actually, to keep the questions away. But you don't necessarily have those. Of course, you have questions, but you don't necessarily have the questions that then lead to a measurement and a sampling <coughs> technique generates data and then you use those data for analysis. That's not necessarily the way that it works for you. So in the absence of those questions, why would you bother thinking about analysis techniques for which you don't have data, for which those data that don't exist don't have a sampling technique and they don't have a question in the first place? It's all arbitrary. In my first year, we answered questions about the differences in the amount of soup in cans. You know, I didn't eat soup out of cans when I was in first year, and I still don't, so it doesn't actually have an awful lot of relevance to me. Running a test comparing the volume of soup in cans is relevant, and all it does, it just creates questions about why the hell am I doing this? So what we do instead is, and I suppose this is just slide two, the slide that has just a wonderful picture of some trees with the sun shining through it. And if you play the lecture, the lecture slides instead of just looking at them in preview, and you put earphones on, you'll hear a wonderful fan-tailed cuckoo calling, and it's really nice, and it would have been a really lovely moment in here. But anyway, that's not. <laughs> instead, I'm describing something to you which seems odd. To generate those questions, especially because this is an ENVS coded course, we go outside and we measure. We go out to Gallimbarri or Black Mountain and we measure trees. We think about things that are in front of us, we think about the vegetation and we think about the place that we are in. And while we're thinking about the place that we're in, let's acknowledge the country that we're doing all that on. Right? So Black Mountain sits within the lands of the Ngunnawal, the Ngunnawal people, the Ngambri, and we also sit in a broader context of the lands of the, the Narago people. And let's acknowledge that country, not just, as I guess other lecturers are doing at the moment, in this moment, at the start of the lecture, let's bear that in mind as we go forward throughout the semester, especially when we are out on Gallimbarri itself. It's a place that has significance locally, as every place does, but it has some parts of Black Mountain have particular significance. Let's be aware of that and carry respect for the country that we're moving around on, especially when we're out there tromping around, stepping on plants and measuring things. So we go out and we measure things, but we don't just measure stuff for no reason. And so if you cycle through a set of slides after this, you'll see that I have slides in which I talk about the role of the information, the sea of information that we are sitting in. 
not necessarily maybe information, opinion that is dispersed throughout our everyday lives and the way that we engage with society. You just, you'd see images there around people who think that CO2 is our friend or I love CO2, I think one of the signs is. You'll see an image there of someone who thinks COVID is a scam. Like you, or many of you I suppose, I've had COVID, didn't feel like a scam. You'll see an image there of politicians on another slide, media individuals who put forward arguments, and you'll see an image there from the protest out the front of the, of, um, well, in the States some years ago, a protest that really challenged the foundations of civil society. Now, why would I put that there when we're talking about environmental matters? Well, all of this is kind of bundled in together. When we start placing opinion and evidence together and treating them the same. I'm not here to tell you that opinions don't matter, but they are not evidence and we need to think critically about all the evidence, all of the opinion around us. And an important thing that courses like this need to be doing is encouraging critical thinking. And it is more important than ever. Everyone will say that, oh, it's more important than ever. Of course, everything's more important than ever. But if you cycle forward maybe two or three slides, you'll see a little symbol that I was presented with when I first thought last year, oh, I'll give this chat GPT thing a crack and see what happens. And the first thing that I saw that I thought was incredibly offensive on the part of chat GPT, it asked me to verify that I was human. Shove it, Jack GPT. I am human. You show me that you're not, that you are. I'm sure other lecturers have talked to you about chat GPT and, the, and other large language models and said, here's the ANU policy. Are you aware of the ANU policy on using things like that? The ANU policy is that we accept that you use it. And I'm not going to show you the policy right now because simply I cannot. And I will <laughs> highlight it to you later in the semester. But my Right. My opinion of it is, of course, I accept that you might use it, and it is in wide use outside of universities. My sparring partner at karate was telling me the other day that they use it in the Department of Environment all the time, generate reports, synthesise material. But like Oliver Arnolds says on that slide, and at some stage, have a listen to his set, he's a great Icelandic artist, AI might be able to recreate what we do. It might be able to synthesise things. But it cannot communicate something to you. It, it doesn't have any original thought, no ideas, no rationale behind it. It doesn't want to say something. It doesn't have a desire. There's, there's nothing there. And when you use it, it's totally cool, no judgments, right? Remember that that when I and other academics ask for assessment, you know, it'd be great if I didn't have to have assessment. I'd really love a course without assessment. Should we give that a crack this year? Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to do that. But when I do, I want to hear from you. Damn the machine that tells me that I have to verify that I'm human. I want to hear from you because it is your your motivation and your argument, your idea, it's you communicating with me. And other lecturers will feel the same. Other lecturers might give you the policy rant, I, I won't. There isn't a lot of writing for you to do in this course, I will say that. But there are, no doubt, will be opportunities in other courses and in this one where you might think about it. Totally fine. Remember, it is just another source. And it is, at times, a pretty crappy source. And an example of that is on the slide, I think, after, after Oliver sitting out there in the cold. A report that was in Nature at the end of last year around the numbers of papers that were retracted, academic peer-reviewed papers that were retracted at the end of, by the end of last year. 10,000. 10,000 papers retracted. 
the previous total in a year was something like 3,230 something like that, or maybe 4,000. We're talking about more than a doubling in the number of papers retracted. Now, it's not all artificially generated material. There's a lot of issues at the core of peer review processes and, and there have been for some time. But bear in mind that there is mindless stuff all around you all the time. It is in the media, it's on your Facebook pages, that social contagion business that I didn't refer to as I was talking before. Have a look at that if you're not familiar with the social contagion experience and experiment. You might have been too young at the time to have been a subject within their study, but without the knowledge of Facebook users, Facebook programmers manipulated the news feed, going to individual users so that they could assess the impact of negative news on Facebook users themselves. Without any ethics approval, without advising anyone they were conducting an experiment, that's a big no-no, but also appreciate that that information is being manipulated as well. Now, I'm not on Facebook, but this is not about me being anti-Facebook, but it's about you just being aware of what's going on around you. And how do you do that? How do we, as university lecturers, especially someone who teaches methods in analysing data that are not necessarily from the media, this is not a course in science and the media, you know. If you want that, then the Centre for the Public Awareness of Science is there, and they have courses like that. This is a course in which we collect and analyse data and we step through how you do that. So what relevance does all this have? Well, we need to encourage critical thinking approaches and there are many, many ways that we can do that as university lecturers. How do we do it in this course? Well, in this course we move that traditional model of statistical teaching aside and we focus on asking some questions. Now, it may be questions that you've never bothered or to think about before, um, but if you go to a slide, so let's, if you could just step forward. Let me just, see. it's hard giving a lecture without slides, but it's kind of fun. So I get to this point where I ask a question of how do we do this? There's a slide there that has an image with a circle on it that shows the problem, plan, data, analysis, conclusion cycle. That is the research cycle. That's how we handle things from a research point of view. And we move from identifying problems, either by casual observations, often that is how it comes about, casual observations, and then interrogating those observations in the context of what we know personally, what experts around us know, what is in the literature, and repeated observations. We test these ideas, and then as we move along, that's when we come up with a design around collecting data. And then once we have that data, we analyse. That first part, though, that problem, identifying a problem is in itself a very circular process. It's, it's a... It's very easy sometimes to make an observation and to come up with a problem and test that, that problem or question that you have. But more often than not, when we identify a problem, identifying that we have a problem or a problem of interest only leads to a greater awareness of the underlying problems that maybe we hadn't even considered, that test, that mean that the knowledge that we have assumed is there isn't present at all. And so we cycle down to smaller and smaller problems. And that's the experience of being in an academic sort of space. You identify problems and then progressively spiral into these smaller problems. An example I'll come to in a moment because that's the example we're going to focus on this year. But be aware that in all of this process, this PPDAC, the problem plan, data, analysis, conclusion cycle. Analysis sits in only one of those components. By the time you get to the analysis end, 
you need to have thought a great deal around the problem itself and developed a plan to collect some data. You need to come up with a sampling strategy, all that stuff. Now, some of it, some of that approach relies upon statistical knowledge. Right? And that's a big part of this course. Generating some statistical understanding, some knowledge. What test, when, what does this data type mean, how do I handle it? Uh, all those kind of things. That's what we'll spend, I'm sorry, that's what we'll spend 80% of the time handling. But we cannot do any of that if we don't have content knowledge, right? We can't ask a question if we don't have the starting point, some knowledge about the system that we're working with, or we, we don't have a question to start with. And to generate that question, we need some knowledge on our content. So there's content Sorry, there's context, let me go back. There's context knowledge and statistical knowledge. And you'll see those arrows on that little figure there that has statistical knowledge and context knowledge. You see the arrows feeding in are fatter than they are from the statistical knowledge because a great component of this research cycle and when we go from making an observation to coming up with a plan and asking the question, then interrogating our data, it's more context than it is statistical. But without that statistical stuff, you know, we're going to be lost. So this year, in terms of context, we're going to ask a question or some questions, and those questions aren't actually identified yet. We're going to sort of think about those questions over the next few weeks. <coughs> But we need to think about and identify questions that we can actually answer, bearing in mind all the limitations associated with managing 250 people who are going out to Black Mountain for the first time and have never measured and don't necessarily have all the context information they need and all of those limitations. We're going to focus on answering some questions. So if you go to the slide after this wonderful arrows and there's a wonderful picture of a tree. At the start of 2020, I live, say, in Aranda on the other side of Black Mountain, and I was on the way through Black Mountain, as I, I ride through most mornings, and I thought, what a wonderful thing it would be to, this year to ask questions around Ogmograptus moths. Now, Ogmograptus moths are the moths that make those wonderful little scribbles on what is referred to as scribbly gum. Now, even in the absence of scribbles, it's still called scribbly gum. And that was what I discovered in 2020, that as I walked through Black Mountain with this wonderful idea I'd been sort of, that had been gestating for weeks, I discovered that the scribbles were almost entirely gone. Scribbly gum was no longer scribbly gum. Now, why, do, why should I expect to see scribbly gum? Scribbles on scribbly gum. Well, not just because it's called that. But as you see on the next slide, scribbles are a fairly ubiquitous component of eucalypt woodlands or forest types like the one that we have on Black Mountain. So there are other species that are referred to as scribbly gum. All of them are scribbled by the same genus of moth. Not the same species, but the same genus. And they're so ubiquitous that Maya Gibbs included them in her Snugglepot and Cuddlepie books. Now, apparently then, that means that they are, they're common everywhere. And we should see them. But in 2020, suddenly there were virtually none. Now, the question becomes, well, what, what happened to them? And if you go to the next slide... Those of you who are in Canberra or in South East Australia or in any part of Eastern Australia in 2020 will remember this pretty, pretty clearly. There are two images there, both of them looking across Marnica uh, over towards, um, I can't remember the name of that hill, but it's where there's a big quarry. Looking across Marnica, and you can see the difference between what Marnica normally looks like in the morning and what it looked like at the start of 2020. The questions are numerous around what happened in 2020 to the moths. You know, did they <coughs> just got to get a cough and just disappeared? Was it too hot? Was it too dry? You know, it was pretty hot and dry coming into 2020. 
What happened to them? Nobody, nobody really knows. It may have actually been a consequence of the sudden change in weather from 2019 into 2020. By the time we got to the start of the semester, we'd had significant rain. And shortly after that significant rain, every scribbly gum on Black Mountain decorticated entirely. So that means it, it threw off all of its outer layers of bark. And in doing so, it may have just shed all of the scribbles. We don't know. But more seriously than that, there are a lot of questions that we have around what happened that we simply have no handle on whatsoever. Now, if you go to the slide, you can see what, on the next slide, you'll see what uh, Ogmograptus looks like. You see they're tiny little moths. They're about a millimetre and a half long. The larvae are tiny little, little larvae that feed under the bark. You never see them unless you peel the bark off. Now, there are some publications focused on Ogmograptus <coughs> moth, but really only two. One, Julia Cook was the lead author in it. Julia Cook, when she did the piece of work that the publication was based on, was a Year 11 student here, I think at Durham Island in Canberra, I think. Anyway, Year 11 student generated the data that then led to this publication. And it was the first publication on Ogmograptus, first or second on Ogmograptus. I think the Horrocks paper came first. So in that paper, she asked some really basic, really simple questions. It's not about the simplicity of the question, it's that you ask it and that you answer it well, that you collect data that are capable of answering it. And that's the more important element. Now, when it comes to Ogmograptus, then we have some questions. To answer where the heck they went in 2020 and then what happened since, we have to get out and we have to collect some data. But to ask that question about what happened in 2020, we need to ask even more basic questions. How many trees would ordinarily, from a percentage or a proportionate basis, how many trees would actually have scribbles normally? Well, according to May Gibbs, <coughs> lots. There must be. For May Gibbs to reflect them as a culturally identifiable attribute, it must be pretty common. But there are no data indicating how common they are. So if they suddenly disappeared, how would we know? Well, this is true of a lot of invertebrate stuff, right? Very, very little known about how many invertebrates, what species, so on, are out there. It's the same for snow gum dieback that I work on. How many trees are ordinarily affected by wood boring beetles in the mountains? Who knows? means we can't tell whether it's a problem or not. Well, it's definitely a problem. Trees are dying all over the place. But how do we discriminate that from the background when we don't have a background? So a question that asks a question about what's the process, what's happened here, well, we need to first understand what the background abundance is before we even kick off into that space. Now, Julia Cook and Ted Edwards' paper attempted to describe some attributes associated with scribbles. You know, they found that they're more common on one side than the other, but that paper in itself has some, some issues as well. All papers have issues. Don't, don't think that um, there are perfect papers out there. Maybe there are, but I certainly haven't written any <laughs> perfect papers. They all have weaknesses, things that the authors have had to do. But there are issues in that paper that mean that maybe some of the things that they put forward need to be retested. And we can only get to that point where we identify what needs to be retested or where weaknesses might sit once we really interrogate a question. And that's what we need to do. We need to interrogate the information in front of us. How do we interrogate? Well, we're going to talk through not just statistical tests and so on, we're going to talk through sampling approaches and the implications and the issues associated with measurement. And yes, we'll spend quite a bit of time dealing with how you analyse the data that you're presented with. But we will also be out there on Black Mountain, Gallenberry. We'll be out there with measurement tapes and little dials to measure 
the scribbles themselves. And we will be talking about scribbles over the course of the semester and pieces of your assessment will ask you about scribbles to apply from lectures, from the content, from what you've been doing, ask you to apply that to the context of scribbles so that we can identify a question and we can get out there and test it. I think I know what's next. I thought it was. So in essence, that's the context, I suppose, for the course. So this course then aims to do a number of things. Aims to you know, give you an introduction in research skills around measurement, sampling, and then analysis. It's the stats course you do when you don't go and do a stats course, right? Although you leave with the same stats background because we cover the same content. As I said, we just handle it in a slightly different way. And we handle it in a different way because we get out there and we measure. And a part of the reason that we get out there and measure is because as a foundational course in environmental science degrees, we need to take environmental science students outside and get you measuring, get you observing, get you thinking about what there is out there around you, thinking about species, maybe encouraging you to uh, become capable in identifying eucalypts. Hey, sorry. Yeah. What's decortication in De terms of the moth larvae? Decortication is when the tree sheds its bark. So the, the bark on the outside is referred to as the cortex, and it just gets rid of it. And you'll see that around. You have a look at the gum bark eucalypts on campus, and you'll see that they've all, they're all flaking off. Um, most of them do it a little bit earlier than now. Um, actually, this week you're going to see some trees that are decorticating as you're measuring them. So we have a measurement base and a practical component that is a central part of the course. If you're a College of Science sort of student and maybe you're doing CAM or you're going to move into med or something and you're thinking, this is bogus, man. I don't want to go out and measure some trees. I'm stiff. <laughs> Sorry, but this is an EMVS course. We've had, I've had this conversation with students in the past, and I, in the past, was really apologetic about it. I'm not anymore. <laughs> right? It's an EMVS course. You don't want to measure trees, that's cool. But we do. All right? And it's actually quite pleasant. You actually, even if you're not intending on doing anything environmental based, being able to appreciate that there are many eucalypts out there and that you can identify them, it's not that hard. You just need the process. Just get on board. You know, it's part of living in the world. All right, so we do that. We also get you to think about writing. I'm not going to ask you to write a scientific article or write in that form. We used to, this course used to be in second semester, and we used to get students to do that. And in second semester, it was a bit of a task, right? In first semester, holy moly. <laughs> For many students, it's the first time they've read an academic paper. And to ask you to write in that form, you know, I'm dreaming. But I can ask you to read one, or a couple, but I can ask you to read them and think about the way they're structured. And think about a paper from a methodological perspective in exactly the same way that we're going to be talking about. I want you to read a paper and I want you to think about it from that point of view. And I don't want you to go to town on the authors because no paper's perfect. Some of them are less perfect than others. But you need, you'll need to critique a paper. I will give you a paper to critique. Right, we'll talk about that later in the semester. But we think about writing, but we think about writing in the context of logic and the way that papers ought to be written. So we'll be doing that in the course as well. Now, insofar as the components of the course, if I am skipping anything, by the way, that are in slides, and you just go, hang on a minute, there's an important point here, and I want you to cover that, can you please go back and cover that bit? Why is there a mullet being eaten by a crocodile, for example? <laughs> so tell me if I've missed something that you need to know and I'll cover it. 
lectures. I've already talked about lectures. Lectures are a really great thing to go to. Maybe you don't believe that, but they're so much better than Zoom. They're so much better than pre-records. Even though you can chipmunk me all you like afterwards, you don't know what that is, try playing at twice speed. I'm sure I sound like Theodore the chipmunk, right? Try not to binge watch uh, lectures. It tends not to work particularly well. A friend of mine's mum tells me a lot about how her son did all his courses at, at university, watching all of them at twice speed while doing other things, all of this stuff, and he just did them all at the end of the semester. Oh, he's so clever, he did it all. Yeah, it tends not to work. Often it tends not to work because you need some time between receiving some content for it to settle. You know, we're all, you're probably familiar with that, I don't need to tell you that. Try to, try to keep pace with the content. You'll need to because there are regular pieces of assessment too and, that, and they are based upon <coughs> lecture content as much as anything else. So one in person and they will have slides from next week on um, and then one online from, th from was it three o'clock this afternoon. All right. Now practicals, there are six practicals in a week. You attend only one of them. And they're a mix of things. They're a mix of computer-based activities. We need to get you familiar with using a program called JMP. But we also encourage you to use Excel. Maybe you've already used Excel, you, you know, you're, an, you know, you're an expert in it. <coughs> but my experience is that students need some help with Excel. Excel is important because it's used so widely and you can do a lot of analysis with it. So we help you build some skill in Excel, as well as JMP, a dedicated piece of stats software. Good chance you won't have access to JMP once you finish your degree, so you need some backup. And Excel is not a bad backup. It's a lot better than it used to be, too. So those practicals, we will be going out to Black Mountain. There's about three times we go out there. But also this week, we have an independent activity where you go out on your own, not very far, you go out on your own and you measure some trees on campus. And I'll send you an email about those measurements and those trees um, a little bit later today. But the important thing is that that practical activity involves you coming to my office, getting a tape, signing something. We need you to sign a physical, believe it or not, physical copy <laughs> of the license for JMP. And then we take all 250 over to ICT and then they take, you know, eight years to process it and then, anyway. So you need to do that. Then you go up and you measure the trees that I will send you the numbers for in your email. But before you do that, you need to just get online and read the diameter lesson. It's a simple thing to do, but there are so many ways to stuff it up. <laughs> right? It's okay if you make mistakes. I'm not fussed about it. Okay? but I need you to get into that headspace of doing some measurement. All right, so that's this week. I will send you an email about it that, that covers the trees and what you need to do. You just come to my office, get a tape, tick some things off and then you're away. Before we leave campus on a prank, you also need to, and you'll see that there's a slide that says mandatory. You need to complete a field safety declaration. So, you know, I'm celiac, but that makes absolutely no difference to you in the field because I tend not to eat sandwiches, right? So you don't need to worry about that, but there you go. I also have, you know, because I'm like 50, I've got less of arthritis in my toe. Also doesn't affect you in any way. But if you, in particular, experience or are at risk of an anaphylactic reaction to an ant bite, I need to know. Important things like that. Lactose intolerant, oh cool, so am I. Other things like that, oh fine. But things like asthma, anaphylaxis, a student a couple of years ago, their knee habitually dislocated. You know, I really needed to know that. Things that impact upon you out there, dust allergies, those kind of things, I need to know. Just so I can be prepared and we're all, we're all safe. Right? So there's the field safety declaration. That's all it's about, just so that I'm prepared and I'm ready to help if I need to. Because I'll be there for every prac. 
I'll be here for every lecture, here for every prank. You'll be so sick to death of me. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Is this data going to get towards something? Because what if we like pop up with like an error or like we get incorrect data? And I'm sorry we can't use other people's data. Well, I can say a lot about this. So the question was around we're collecting our, our own data. What if we make an error, make a mistake, and there's some issues with it? I can guarantee someone's going to make a mistake. It's as we will talk about next week, this is part of measurement. And you know the other thing is that for the most part, if it weren't these trees and you made a mistake, there's no way I would know. <laughs> there's actually no way without having data quality processes in place anyone knows, ever. It's okay to make mistakes. <laughs> no, it's an important part of measurement, right? If you make mistakes, that's okay. What we aim to do is minimise human error in measurement. But part of the activity this week, you know, full disclosure on my part, is about you making mistakes. That's fine. I, I expect it. That's okay. I make mistakes all the time. You know, we make mistakes. That's why pencils, you know, they have rubbers on the ends. It's fine. Insofar as your data and what happens about your mistakes, that's fine. We all get to share in them. We all share data. It's absolutely essential. We, you cannot pull off any assessment just with your measurements. So it's totally fine. Um, all right, so where are we up to? So let's talk about assessment then with four minutes to go. Of course, does have assessment. By and large, so what do we have? Uh, I have to look at the outline again. We have a handful of quizzes. All of the quizzes are online. All of the quizzes open for a full week. And you have a full week to, to, to handle them. You can open the quiz, look at the questions. Hmm. I'm going to close that and think about it. You can open and close it as many times as you want. Just don't press the submit and finish button. Just think about it. I'm sitting next to my friend and we might, you know, Occasionally work together on stuff, cool. I'm not confronted by you working together. You work together on a quiz, you might be helping each other, you might be helping each other learn, right? I'm cool with that, that's fine. Of course, you need to interrogate the quality of your friend's advice and opinion. You need to think for yourself, but I'm okay with that. There is a piece of assessment towards the end there around critiquing a paper. I will, for each of you, I'll send you a paper name and you'll need to find that paper and you'll need to read it. And you'll need to read that paper and critique it from a structural perspective and I'll give you some content around how you might do that, but also from a methodological perspective. Now that's submitted online through Turnitin. If you haven't seen that before, well, you will. And then for the undergraduates, there's an exam at the end for the graduate students, there's a written, there's actually a, a, a written piece that you need to complete instead of the exam. Now, what have I not covered that you need to know? One thing that really strikes me, and you will see that figure just after I highlight um, assessment towards the end, there'll be an outline of the assessment, and then there'll be this histogram on the next slide with a portion of the, of the previous population of students who have completed the course in pink or sort of light red and the others in blue. If you were thinking about how do I pass this course, I'm really worried about this course, right? Stats, I've done everything I can in my life up until now to avoid math and stats. I'm concerned about this course. The pink coloured bars in that histogram are students who submitted everything. And you will see that a tiny, tiny fraction of those students didn't pass. Oh, actually, it's the other way around. The blue ones submitted everything. Not the, sorry. So you can see what kind of marks students are getting when they submit everything. Now, there are at times, this is not about me saying, 
You ought to submit everything or you'll fail, right? There are times when submitting work becomes a problem. You're in first year, and that's not me saying you're little babies and we're going to baby you, right? But this is a challenge. Transitioning to university can be a challenge. And if you're having difficulties, you need a hand with assessment. You've got something on and it's a problem, 